Church, let's stand for the reading of the word together. Very brief portion of scripture tonight as we're in a new section, but it's one that you're going to immediately recognize. And we'll go as far as we can tonight, but you'll see the power of this. One of your favorite verses, actually, is right here in this section of just three scriptures. And uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. And uh, you guys know how for months we've been talking about unbelief? Well, tonight we start this portion of scripture, the cure for unbelief. And it's awesome. It's exciting. And so I'll read verse 11. If you read verse 12... I'll read the last verse, verse 13. You get to read the great verse, though, the, the, the amazing verse. So you're, you're blessed and privileged tonight for sure. Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall or fail, fall according to the same example of disobedience. Is that a wow or what? Verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Father, bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The cure for unbelief. I think these passages of scripture are going to become more dear to us as time goes on. As we get further down the road of the prophetic time frame and the, and the time scale of events, friends, if you're not aware, the Bible is extremely clear about how do we know how we're approaching the days and the age in which we live in. These are remarkable times. I could actually just not even look at the notes tonight and not even go on any further, and I could talk the rest of the evening on Signs that indicate the nearness of the Lord's return. This is something, listen everybody, this is something that has been promised to us by God himself. You need to know that. That's not something uh, radical or extravagant or weird that somebody might think, uh, oh, there's signs uh, of Christ's return. Jesus said there'd be signs of his return. And the Bible says that God would give us indicators and signs that we might know that his approach is near. And so we need to fight many of the narratives that are out there today in just what is the the, the latest genre of what is being uh, dubbed as Christianity or churchianity. And that is that there's liberalism and progressive Christianity that is destroying many people. Now, I'm sorry, but I have a very firm belief that all those who are God's kids will be God's kids, and not one of them will be lost in the day of death or judgment. And in the last days, when we see things stirring up and things happening, you need to understand something, that everything that you and I are living through and what we're going to go through in life, God has anticipated in the Bible for us, that we don't need to be worried or in any way upset, and um, I feel kind of alone when it comes to pastors, when we talk about things like what I'm about to say, I don't think you guys uh, view this new, but um, I was with pastors this last week, and uh, oh boy, isn't it something, what's going on, and there's so many people following the way, and there's so many, uh, listen, there's so many uh, really great pastors that are no longer believing in the gospel anymore. Excuse me, what? What are you concerned about? Why are, you, why are we talking about this? Um, think about it. I'm not being cold-hearted. I'm just telling you something. That all those who belong to the Lord are safe in his hands. And in the last days, one of the great indicators is that there'd be many people departing from the faith. Many people would give up on the power of the word of God. And I want you to know that you need to be strong. Now look, I want to believe that every single one of you here tonight would never fall for anything that is not of God. Every pastor believes that his flock is bulletproof. Because think about that that sense or that feeling that we have as teachers. 
We labor in the word, we pray for you, and then we give our lives out to teach you the word, and we want you to know Jesus, and none of us want to think that among us there could be a tear or a wolf. But might I remind you that Jesus pastored a church of only 12 people, and one of them was the devil. <laughs> so how do we navigate this time? This portion of scripture is very good for us to understand. The cure for unbelief. Let's just jump right into it. In verse 11, we see that if there's going to be a cure for unbelief, church, it's this. is that we flee from all things that murder faith. I put that down. It sounds violent, doesn't it? Good. Flee. The word in the Greek, by the way, for uh, when you see the word flee, to run, uh, in the Greek language, means uh, to be a, um, a fugitive. Like a fugitive runs and is on the run. So when this title of this first argument, flee, that is be a fugitive, run from all the things that would murder faith in your life. Like never before, you and I need to just absolutely get so incredibly real about what in the world is going on in this thing called Christianity, faith, and these last days. And what does it mean to be a believer? It means in this day and age for us to kind of get maybe uh, sent to boot camp, right? So, so as I mentioned, we were at pastors. We were down in San Diego, and right by where uh, the meeting place was, uh, the, the SEALs, the U.S. Navy SEALs, were training uh, down in Coronado. And uh, there's, I forget the number, but there's so many that sign up, but there's just few who make it. And always there, uh, in the training field, there's a bell. There's a bell that when you want to quit, you have to go ring the bell. And the instructors are constantly calling you all kinds of names like, like I'm not allowed to say today, uh, like girl, how, how uh, can you believe that? I can't believe you just said that. Yeah, these, 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 these SEAL instructors are yelling at these guys, calling them girls. Does that, does that offend you? If it does, then you'll never be able to be a SEAL. Um, they're called ladies. And all this stuff is going on. Now listen, are the instructors trying to destroy these guys? No, the instructors are trying to bring these guys to recognize that there's somebody inside of them that they've not met yet. Everyone in that team are already seasoned Marine or Navy personnel. They have advanced to SEAL training. This is not new to them, but they've got to dig down and grab something that they believe is there, but they're not sure. And the only way to find out if that seal mentality is within them is for them to be pushed to the limit instead of snapping, that individual comes out and out of them. And there's always the temptation to quit. There's always the bell that you can run up and ring and you're gone, you're free. You get to go take a hot shower. You get to go back and relax. It's over for you. But there's something about having made it through that you get your trident. And now, by the way, I had a U.S. Uh, Navy uh, SEAL Team 3 uh, SEAL tell me, he said, listen, by the time you get your trident put on your chest, he said, we literally believe we're invincible. And they put that in them. Now, you might say, well, they're not really invincible. I understand that. The correlation is this. We're not SEALs. We're followers of Jesus. It's the troubles in this life that cause us to dig down deep and find out what's inside of us. And when we pull the stuff up, it turns out to be the Holy Spirit that's got us anchored to the Word of God. If the Word of God is not firm and anchored in your life tonight, then you're in peril, my friends. Your marriage is in peril. Your home's in peril. Your faith is in peril. And this is a very serious thing. We want to be very, very vigilant to watch out for things that murder faith. 
When it says here in scripture, chapter 4, verse 11, let us therefore, this is very much a spiritual ultimatum. It, 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 it's not by force, but it's by truth. Let us therefore, strong term, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We've been learning for these last few weeks, the disobedience refers to the children of Israel in the wilderness wanderings. They failed to believe God. They failed to trust him. So we're done with that. We now know what that means. That same exact example of disobedience, we can learn from it. Write it down. It's not in your notes. It won't be on the screen. Romans 15 verse 4 announces to us that by all of these things in Scripture that we learned, the previous things that have all been written down, Paul tells the church at Rome that we learn so that by patience we might inherit the promises that God has given us. And promises imply or presuppose, think about it, a wanting, a need to be comforted or to be having something fulfilled. A promise means nothing to you unless you're in need. Does that make sense? I promise to pick you up at six o'clock or I promise to help you with that or this. A promise presupposes, as it were, a hostile environment. And they didn't believe in him. They didn't trust him. And when in the hour of decision came, they collapsed. Or for them, it was a series of hours that led up to years. Talk about the patience of God who put up with perpetual mockings and rejections from the children of Israel. But let me tell you, as we look at this, we want to be so incredibly careful that we flee from everything that can murder faith because, friends, in our world today, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in such a way, but I'll just have to trust the Lord, and I'll just say it like this, really plain and simple. <laughs> you can have all the money in the world, you can have the cars, you can have the looks, you can have the power, you can have the position, you can have the education. Right. I'm not knocking any of that stuff. It's irrelevant, frankly. But if your faith is diminishing, it should, it should scare you to the core because faith is the greatest thing that you can possess. Faith is the greatest. Thing. Now look, when I say faith, I'm not saying having faith in faith. That's stupid. I'm talking about you having faith in the almighty God to keep his word and that when he makes you a promise... He will fulfill it. And when boot camp comes or SEAL training comes to your door, there's always going to be the temptation to tap out and ring the bell. Every single one of us will be experiencing, if we haven't already, it'll come again to us, that temptation to quit. You start second guessing. You start wondering. Things that murder faith. We want to be careful. Your faith is the greatest thing that you possess. In Psalm 119, verse 11, Psalm 119, verse 11, <coughs> excuse me, the Bible there says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes, teach me your commands, your instructions. But notice where the Bible is supposed to go. The Bible is supposed to go in the heart. A lot of people are attacking the Bible today. I don't, get, I don't get upset at them for attacking the Bible. It's demonic powers that are behind, which again are indicators of the last days. Listen, you hide God's word in your heart. Let's be honest. If somebody takes all of our Bibles and burns them and, and you can't get a Bible, guess what? We're okay. Did you know that? Now, I know my Muslim friends, they kind of freak out over this because the Quran, you know, in a Muslim home, uh, Quran's got to be placed at the highest. It cannot be down low. It's got to be revered, and it, can't, and, and it would be uh, an absolute abomination if, if the Quran was in any way defamed or burned or mocked or whatever. I want you to know something. God says, take my word and hide it in your heart. Why? Because we may not always have a Bible. 
You think about that for a moment. What if you were carted away somewhere somehow? What if in some way, shape, or form, God's word hidden in our hearts causes our faith to have resolve and it causes our faith in God to be unwavering. That's why we read of the greats of yesteryear and throughout history. By the way, I really encourage you to do this, especially you young people. You want to read, you know, a lot of people like scary stuff. I don't like scary movies. I don't just, I made that mistake once in my life as a teenager. Somebody said, we got to go see this movie. And I, I, okay. And I don't know, let me think. It was something called, let me see, The Exorcist. (laughs) And I just remember coming home that night, reaching in and flipping on the lights. You know what I'm talking about? If you've not seen it, do not. I think it was demonically empowered. And um, that was the end of it. I've never seen scary movies since then. And... um, this last week, we were at the beach and uh, on Monday, I think it was Monday, it doesn't matter, and um, somebody in our group uh, recognized uh, Freddy Krueger. That's Freddy Krueger, the guy that played Freddy Krueger. I go, who's Freddy Krueger? I didn't know. You know, that guy that, and I didn't know. He was like, I, I, I don't know. I'm happily ignorant about that stuff. But I got to tell you, (laughs) with all that the world can throw at us, there's no greater peace in the midst of scary things than than to have the word of God hidden in your heart. Why? Because God's word hidden in your heart will reserve and protect and guard that faith that's within you. You want to be watching out for things that could murder the faith. And we're going to list those things in a moment. Some of those things, of course. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Richly. Circle the word. It's amazing. Let the word of God overflow, effervescent. Let it be taking root in every area of your life. In all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. By the way, this is a definition or defining the conduct of the church. This is how we're supposed to be. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You did that a moment ago? Think about that. If any church focuses on Colossians 3.16, for that to be their marching orders, they're going to succeed. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Faith. Watch out that faith is not murdered. Do everything you can to strengthen your faith. More than ever. And I love the fact that it says, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. That is a great thing. Friend, listen up. If there's something going on in your life and you're not too sure, it might be a little sketchy, you're not sure if God's happy with it or not, First of all, if you're not sure if God's happy with it or not, there's about a 100% chance God's not happy with it. Because if he was happy with it, you wouldn't have a troubled conscience. God never wants you to be in violation of your conscience. Did you know that? And by the way, God will see to it that your conscience leans towards righteousness. Notice that. Some people call that Jiminy Cricket. I call that the Holy Spirit. Talking on your shoulder, as it were, or from inside of your heart. Remarkable. One more on this, Jeremiah 15, 16. This is one of the uh, first few verses I memorized as a brand new believer. And um, why? Because it brought so much joy to my heart and it strengthened my faith. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, your words were found. So think about that when you study the Bible, when you turn the pages of your Bible. Think about that. Your words were found and I ate them. Or how about this? I ate it up. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. That's what God says. The Bible says, get into his word, find out something. What do you find out? Isn't it amazing? When you read the Bible, you find out that God is pulling you closer to him, not pushing you away. Isn't that cool? 
When I find the word and I dig into the word, I find out that I'm called. Notice the assurance. I dis- I, I'm, I'm full of joy because I, I discover that I'm called by his name. He has me in his family. I'm, I, I, I'm under his banner of love, as the scripture teaches. So the cure for unbelief is to flee all things that murder faith. And number one is this, flee murder by allurements. Watch out about and for allurements. Allurements. In the word allure or allurements is the word lure. When you think of a lure, what, what do you think about? Fishing. Why? Because you use a lure to catch fish. Satan uses everything that will work on you to lure you away. And when he does that, he uses allurements to get your eyes off of Christ, to get your eyes off the Bible and onto other things. And by the way, one of the most dangerous things is that Satan will get your eyes off of God onto something really good. Did you hear what I said? Watch out for things that are really good. Some of you may be seasoned saints enough to where the normal run-of-the-mill temptations don't work on you. Hey, listen, get the book of C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters. Have you read? Raise your hand if you've read that book. Okay, that's not enough. People, you must read Screw Tape Letters. Screw Tape Letters. Go to Amazon or listen to it. The book, Drive, listen to it. It's very short. It's very powerful. It's a dialogue between two demons written and seen by C.S. Lewis, and there's nothing that compares. And boy, will it open your eyes to the things that tempt you that are really good. Hey, I can get a raise. This place, they offered me a job, $1.50 more, $2, $10 more an hour. That's got to be from God, right? Let's do it. Wow. Watch out. Pray about everything. Watch out for allurements. The Bible says there that let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. And so to be diligent is to to make every effort, that word means to give all attention to, to be eager to perform or to perform it. So listen, I want to march through this. What is to be our responsibility to such a great salvation so freely provided to us by Jesus? It's for you and I to present ourselves to him diligently. But everything. I think people today need to be either challenged or uh, reawakened to the fact that uh, God wants all of you. All of you. People need to know that. Let's be honest. Let's be honest with the young people today. Uh, Loving God and knowing God is not an add-on to your life. I think people were built and designed to throw themselves 100% at something. You would never say, well, hi, honey, I love you 80%. (laughs) That whole relational thing is supposed to be 100% in. And if it's true with a husband and a wife, how much more true is it between us and God? All in. And young people today, you you want to, listen, you want some one or something to live and even die for with joy? It's him. It's Jesus. It's knowing God. What, what, 80%? No, 100%. Throw yourself completely in. Isn't it amazing that the cults around the world demand 110% from their adherents? And people get in line and sign up. And they're totally committed. You see people, listen, this is summer in Southern California. It's hot, but you see people riding 10 speeds, going door to door with their religious stuff. That's commitment. I'd use a car, an air conditioned car. And I would trade in that book for the book and, uh, and know the real Jesus. Isn't it interesting? We as Christians say, well, you know, come to Jesus, accept Christ. There's nothing, don't worry about it. Don't you have to make, I mean, don't do that. People are looking for a radical conversion in their life. And Christ is the one that brings it. So, so very true. Allurements. We need to present ourselves to him. 
Matthew 6.33. This is how we combat. Are you ready? This is how we combat the allurements of the devil or the allurements of the world or the allurements of this flesh of ours. Are you guys here? Yeah. You guys awake? Okay, good. So quiet. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. A beloved verse, everybody. Uh, but seek first the kingdom of God. Make that number one priority. Not money, not him, not her, not it. Him. Seek him first in the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Wow, put it in order. God first. People say, I want to get married. Put God first. We want to have kids. Put God first, right? I want to make money. God first. I, look, I want to serve the Lord. Watch out. God first. A lot of people are lost in serving the Lord. They get so busy, they forget about hanging out with him. And then you get muddied up in religion. John chapter 15, verse 5 and 6. Jesus said, I'm the vine. Oh, wow. And you are the branches. We're branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them together and throw them into the fire and they're burned. You did not, verse 16, dropping down to verse 16, you did not choose me, I love this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, and whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. I love this because Jesus starts out in John 15 saying, you got to bear fruit. And at the first, you start worrying about it. Oh no, oh my goodness. Now, as I said before, whenever you see a fruit tree, you never, you never walk by the fruit tree or walk through an orchard and, or out here uh, in wintertime, you'll see the orange trees in blue, uh, with the oranges out there. You never walk by and you hear an orange tree going, mm. <laughs> You don't see the date palms going, ah. They don't do any of that. My daughter lives up in almond country in California. And as far as you can see is almonds. You don't walk down through the almond grove and hear those guys going, ah, trying to produce an almond. The roots are down in the ground, drawing nutrients just the way God designed it. That tree is there in the breeze, in the sun, and it's growing, and its natural production is almonds or oranges or bananas or whatever we're talking about. If you abide in him, where you say, I am going to be with Jesus day in, day out. Hey, listen, just don't tell anybody, but just us. Do you ever go through spiritual dry spells? No? You guys should get born again. Then you'll experience <laughs> spiritual dry spells. Can I ask you again? Let's, let's rewind that and pretend. Remember, you're in church right now. You, got, you should tell the truth. Do you ever go through spiritual dry spells? Yes. yes, we do. And what do we do when that happens? Hang on. You don't go ring the bell. You don't quit. You don't stop. You don't give up. That's the great moment of faith being tested. A couple of weeks ago, I was going through a couple, actually, it was probably a good month and a half. I was going through a dry spell that ended a couple of weeks ago. Now, did you know that? You didn't know that. Why? Because it's not for me. It's not for me to announce that to you. It's for me to abide in Christ. Amen. So what does that mean, a dry spell? When you read the Bible and it's like, what is it saying? <laughs> when you pray and it feels like the ceiling is made of steel. When you get up in the morning and the sun is shining, but there's, everything's dark. You know what I'm talking about? When there's this sense where God is nowhere. I remember years ago a friend saying, Jack, it's not, it's not nowhere. You need to separate the words differently. It's now here, not nowhere. <laughs> That's a good word. I don't feel like God's with me. I don't see him anywhere. I don't feel him nowhere. No, no, no. The truth is when you're like that, the fact is he's now here. The reason why there's this void or darkness is because you're being tested. 
and your roots, listen, the, the bigger the winds, the bigger the storms, the trees grow, the deeper the roots. Did you know that? Where it's really just no weather, the trees are shallow. And that's true in our lives. We have to remember that. But I love the fact that verse 16 tells us, if you're mine, you're going to bear fruit. If you belong to me, you're going to be fruity. Amen. It's going to happen. <laughs> Doing a lot of talking about California fruit. Got to include nuts in there somehow. Like we're the nut capital of America. I mean, we produce more nuts than anybody. And, uh, and we also produce really good nuts, almonds and pistachios. They're not just limited to political nuts. We produce all kinds of nuts. It's California, man. Stick it in the ground, it grows. Jesus said, listen, you will produce fruit. I'll see to it. I love that. Just stay with me, Jack. And fruit's going to come. Psalm 37, 4. You writing these down? I've worked hard to get these for you. You need to write them down. Psalm 37, verse 4. I love this one. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Delight yourself. That is, if you forget everything tonight, remember those two words. Delight yourself. Wow. How do I do that? You do this. You absolutely immerse yourself in the promises of God, in the word of God, in the instruction of God's word. And I tell you what, delight yourself in the Lord and he says that he'll give you the desires of your heart. Yeah, that's a very cool, cool passage because it means that when you are just so delighting in the Lord, your heart winds up becoming perfectly, watch this, perfectly in line with God's will. And here's, what's, here's the fun part is that when your heart's in line with his will because you've, you've, you've been delighting yourself in him, you will have a desire and you'll ask the question, is, I wonder if that desire, oh, I, I wonder what God thinks about that because I think that would be amazing. And all the while, because you've been walking with him and delighting in him, he put that desire in you. And so when you say, Lord, um, do you think maybe that, and whatever that is, and then God answers, you freak. Why? Because, listen, he loves to bless obedience. He loves to bless his kids. You see, yeah, but it says that if I, I ask anything, he's going to do that. He's going to give that. Listen, when you are delighting in him and walking with him, again, your heart will be aligned with his. And you're going to ask what God puts on your heart. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah, it Jeremiah 29, 11 and 13. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Wow, I'm thinking right now as I'm reading that, didn't all the kids go back to school this week? <laughs> Just about. Listen up, kids, students. God says, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. You need to have that stapled to your jacket or something in, in school to give you a future and a hope, not to suck the life out of you, not to molest your mind. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This is so amazing. Is your life on fire with Jesus? It's because you've been searching him. If your heart is not on fire for Jesus, it's because you're not searching after him. It's that simple. Well, my Christianity's boring. That's on you. <laughs> well, it didn't seem to work. That's you. You're, you, you don't even realize you're making an admission about yourself. Seek him with all your heart. How many people have we met over the years? I tried Christianity. It didn't work for me. That speaks volumes. We know exactly what happened. <laughs> Ephesians 1, verse 9. Ephesians 1, verse 9 through 11. This is, remember, this is all how we protect ourselves against having our faith murdered. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, we would ask the question, well, what's that? According to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, wow, so that means this is all him, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together, that means throughout all time since Adam and Eve, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him, verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What does that mean? That means God has given us faith as a gift. Think about it. Grace and faith gifted to us. And what he has imparted, he's going to watch over, nurture. He's going to trim water and make sure that it grows. So listen, we want to cooperate with him. How do we keep faith from being murdered in our lives? Cooperate with God. Now, that's Ephesians 1, 9 through 11. Listen to Colossians 1, 9 through 11. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Wow. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. Notice, I love that, that you be strengthened, but it's based on his power. I love that. It's not that I am strengthened because of my power. I'm strengthened because of his power. For all patience and long suffering with joy. He'll never abandon you. And so listen, you might, you might want to write these down. Um... Things that murder faith. And uh, uh, ingratitude will murder faith. Ingratitude. Or you might say an unthankful heart. That murders faith. Why? Because an unthankful heart, ingratitude, is self, it's, self, it's inward looking. And, be, and, and it's self-focusing, not God-focused. That will murder faith. You see people make a profession of faith, but they just can't get away from themselves. How many people, and I trust it's us, you've made a profession of faith and then you find out that you are the biggest problem. The Christian realizes the biggest problem in their Christian life is me. I want God to protect me from myself. <laughs> As far as I understand the scripture, Satan can only go so far. How many people have fallen because of self-inflicted wounds, spiritually speaking? Again, remember, Satan cannot make you do a thing. He can only allure you. Remember, well, no, you're not going to remember, but when I was a little kid, there was a show, the Flip Wilson Show. And uh, said about seven of us know about this show right now. <laughs> and he would say, he'd say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Everything that happened, he would say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> the devil cannot make you do anything. He's just really good at tempting. Yeah. Things that murder faith. Lying murders faith. There's something about a lie and lying that murders faith. There's two things that you can't say it's one worse than the other because all sin to God is bad. You, we all agree? It doesn't matter if it's a white lie. If there's, there's no such thing as a white lie. But, uh, or, or murder to God, it's all bad. We're the ones that put things in category. Well, that was a category B sin right there, brother. Man, I'm telling you. It was almost an A, but you kept it in the B compartment. So, no, no, God doesn't do that. But um, there is two types of sin that just have special uh, punishments to them and if not punishments, they have special uh, ramifications, special, what's the word? Uh, consequences, thank you. 
that they're, they're set. You can't do anything about it, no matter what, no matter what level of repentance. It's still going to play out. And that is a lie. And that is sexual immorality. Those two things, God's made really clear. And, and both of them throughout the scriptures constantly allude to the spiritual connection that they have in the physical realm. For example, when you tell a lie, Jesus says, that's not from God, that's from Satan, and you're serving Satan when you lie. When you embellish and make up the story, you're, you're, you're serving his purposes. It's like, Jack, how can it be such a big deal if I say the fish was this big when it was only this big? Look, I don't know exactly, but God says in the Bible, no liar is going to inherit heaven. And then on the other side, God says, no, no one who practices sexual immorality is going to go to heaven either, he said. What is that? Aberrant sexuality. What is that? The Bible's crystal clear. We are to control ourselves sexually, keep ourselves healthy and pure, until marriage. That's what the Bible teaches. Oh, man, that's ridiculous. Well, look around the world and see how it's going for them. You say, well, I'm here tonight, and I've, I've crossed those lines. What do I do? You acknowledge that to him. Don't tell anybody around you. Don't tell me. You go to God. And say, Lord, I've crossed the line on that. Please forgive me. You go to him. But those are, listen, those are sins that have spiritual dynamic to them. I don't know exactly why. I don't know if anybody knows exactly why. The next thing is this. Believe it or not, a sense of entitlement murders faith. I don't need to look to God for that. I'm going to look to the system to give me this. I don't need to go to God for that. I'm going to go to the government for that. Government, the, the little God, the little G. Isn't it interesting? God, out of love, sa says to us, to keep your heart right, you should tithe. It keeps your heart right. You know this is true. When you don't want to tithe, I, your heart's wrong. I remember Lisa beat, beat me up one time about that when I was dating her, and they, they were passing the offering at Calvary Costa Mesa, and we were like on our third date. Our first date was to church. And this is like about our third date. The plate, the, the, wasn't a plate, it was the bag. A bag went by and I just handed it to the next guy and she goes, what? excuse me, what? <laughs> and I go, what? She goes, you didn't put anything in there, you didn't tithe. And I said, come on, look around. These, the church is doing fine. <laughs> no, I did, I did, that's what I did. I didn't know. I'd been a Christian for about a year. She'd been a Christian since she was five. She said, I've been tithing since I was five. Do you understand that that's thanking God for what he's given you throughout the week? And, and let me tell you, she went up one side down the other. And it's like, man, I'll never do that again. It's like, watch, here comes the plate. Watch, Lisa. No, I'm, I just dove head first right into the plate. But listen, when you expect government to be your God, it's not tithing, it's taxing. No pun intended, it's taxing. It's taxes and it's taxing. Isn't that interesting? How politics vies for the position of God? Unbelief, we know this already in this series, Murderous Faith. I know I sound like your grandpa tonight, but I'd be really happy if you just stopped reading books and just read the Bible. So what are you saying? You, you just wrote a book. Don't read it. <laughs> read your Bible. We need more, we need to, we need to meet, read more Bible. It's never a wasted moment. And you know the enemies that work in our lives, when you know, you, you think, you go, man, I got a half an hour right now. I have a half hour. I don't know what to do with myself. 
They're not here yet to pick me up. I got nothing to do. I'm sitting here. And you know what happened? Do you hear in your head? Do you hear? Pick up the Bible. I, I, could read, I, I could open my Bible right now. Pick it up. Oh, but where would I turn to? Have you ever had that thought? Is it just me? Or are you guys liars tonight? Have you ever had the thought, where do I? I've got, I got 15 minutes, but where? It's such a big book. What's going on? The enemy will do anything to try to nurture and gin up unbelief. The next thing is, and we'll have to end here in a moment with this. The, the next thing is just what I call a mental routine. A mental routine can murder faith. So what do you mean by that mental routine? Well, do you know how some people do, uh, is it Sudoku? Lisa, she already graduated from all that stuff. Now she's into whatever she does with the memory in the, on the iPad. And it's just, it's, it's all about keeping your brain healthy and all, and all that. That's good. And you're supposed to do that. Elasticity of the mind and, and all. But when you get in a when you get in a rut, when you're m- mentally, mentally, if you're in a routine, your mind almost goes to sleep. It's almost comatose while yet you're moving through everyday life. And somebody were to stop and ask you, "Hey, what were you doing today at three o'clock?" This is the first telling response. <laughs> uh. Like that's a word. Uh, now look, if you're 100 years old, there's grace for that. But when you're 21 and you go, uh, what's going on? God has given you a mind that is to be energized and stimulated by the things of our lives lived. Issues. You say, Jack, I don't, I don't get that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because in our world, we have worked so hard to unplug ourselves from thinking that we have spent billions of dollars to create uh, amusement parks. They're not amusement parks. Do you know what a mu? You know what I'm saying? Muse versus a muse. A amusement park would mean we all go there and we think. What are you doing? I'm musing. <laughs> it would be like Paul going to Athens and he goes to Mars Hill. Remember what the book of Acts chapter 17 says. It says that all of the philosophers and thinkers of the age would come and they would argue different things back and forth and they would tell things and they would challenge one another. That's beautiful, by the way. When Paul showed up, they were amusing on the issues of the day. Imagine if Paul were to show up and they were amusing. See, what would that look like? They would all be sitting down with their iPads doing nothing. Do you hear me? This is why you are committed to trying to get your kid off of the device. Because you see something's wrong. Look, I'm not kidding. Take a picture of your child. Take video of your kid using the device. The the back begins to bulge. The neck goes forward. The skull brings the neck forward. The jaw goes down. And there's this curvature. Seriously. It's physically damaging. I talked to a doctor. He said, I let my kids play on their devices so much per day, but they have to do it on their stomach. They have to lay on their tummy so their head is up because he said that position is at least healthy. 
Regarding our lives, church, we can be so stuck in a routine, we haven't paid attention to one thing that's gone on in the world around us. I think a lot of the church, not this church, but you guys are informed about everything all the time. But a lot of churches, a lot of Christians don't have a clue that Liz Cheney lost in a massive landslide today. They say, why is that important? Isn't that a political issue? Not when someone who hates the Constitution goes down. That's a good day. Right? You think of that. And then there's the heartbreak. See, the mind stimulated, not in a routine. The heartbreak of some 28 Christians being beheaded in Afghanistan today for their faith. All they had to do is say, Jesus is not Lord. Did you know that? All they had to do is say, Jesus isn't Lord. And then I'll end with this one. A physically idle life can murder faith. Physically idle life. Some will argue this, but you know the Bible, I believe in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I think it is. The scripture says that God has created us. May the Lord sanctify us fully, body, soul, and spirit. Some say that man is a dichotomy. Some say man is a trichotomy. I believe we are a trichotomy. Be that as it may, what makes you who you are is a multifaceted being. You have a body, you have a mind, and you have a spirit. And again, I may sound like your grandpa, but back in the day when we used to walk to school <laughs> uphill both ways <laughs> in the snow in San Diego, <laughs> no, an, an idle life physically. And again, church, you know this is true. Look how many people are being murdered so to speak, that have no motivation to get up and get out. They're just, they're breathing. And they're not, in, they're not, they're not, at, they're not looking beyond the, they live in their gaming world and they've never thought for a moment, gosh, I wonder if my neighbors, I haven't seen my neighbors in a month, are they alive? You know, it's possible, your neighbor's dead and you don't even know it. Have you knocked on their door? Or have I paid, have I paid the mortgage? <laughs> Seems like I forgot. These things are really happening to people. We'll pick it up next time together, but I, I think if we approach tomorrow morning thinking, what are the things that could be murdering my faith? Um... I think that's going to be a pretty deep moment. How about, how about we do this? Wednesday nighters. We won't tell the Sunday people. We'll, we'll, we'll just do it. We'll do it ourselves. What if we get up tomorrow, whatever time you have to get up, what, what, how about getting up 30 minutes beforehand? Whatever time. If, if you get up at 6, get up at 5.30. Get out of bed, and for this reason, get on your knees. You say, I don't have to get on my knees to pray. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, let's do this. <laughs> of course not, but you fall asleep if you don't. <laughs> God, listen, if we get on our knees, it's very uncomfortable, you know? That's why you do it. Did you know that? It's, a, get on your knees and pray and watch how focused your prayer life is versus <laughs> laying in bed or even taking a walk. Get on your knees, because I gotta tell you, after about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, your lower back starts hurting. And that's at the point when you realize, my knees are numb. <laughs> but the whole time you've been thinking, as you've been praying, try it. Why don't we, why doesn't the, what, the Wednesday nighters? We'll start that tomorrow. <laughs> or tonight. And pray and ask the Lord, Lord, are there any th threats to my life in the area of faith? Is my faith being threatened in a bad way in any way, shape, or form?
Is there something I'm allowing? Is there something? Is it omission? Is there something I should be doing but I'm not? Is there a way that I'm not thinking right? Because friends, let's stand, let's stand. This is how you and I want to end our lives. We want to end our lives making sure that everything is covered. Everything has been examined. The scripture says, <laughs> examine yourselves to determine whether you are in the faith or not. Okay, examine your, it doesn't mean examine your neighbor. Hey, let me, <laughs> let me tell you about you. No, the Bible says you're supposed to examine your own faith to determine if you're for real. Right? Okay, so now you're Wednesday nighters, so by, so it's Wednesday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you should be glowing <laughs> by Sunday. People are gonna, Sunday people are gonna be going, what happened to you? You're gonna say, yeah, it all happened on Wednesday night. <laughs> Father, with all seriousness, we ask of you, Lord God, that you'd search our hearts and our minds, our lives, our conduct, our activity, what we're doing that might be off or what we're not doing that we should be doing. We're asking you, Father, to baptize us afresh in the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord God, to pull us in tight into the vine. And Lord, that we might be so possessed by the power of God flowing through our lives that you would so galvanize us in this day and age. As your Bible says, the righteous, they are as bold as lions. That's awesome. If there's anything unrighteous, Lord, show us that we might walk closer to you and more bold in Jesus than ever before. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's bless his heart.